Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new year, for a fresh start, that we may serve you as your people. As we remember all the blessings that you have showered upon us by your grace, we pray that you will fill us with praise and thanksgiving to you. And as we consider your great plan for the world, help us to align our plans this year with your great plan. By your Holy Spirit, enable me to preach your word faithfully and help us all to respond rightly, that we may live to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what is God's will for our church? What is God's will for our church? Today is a joyful day and a very special day uh, for many of us. Uh, it's a fresh start for us all. We leave behind 2022. Uh, with all of its joys and perhaps many struggles as well. And we look forward to a brand new year. I think it's always a time of anticipation and, uh, and hope, isn't it? As you watch the fireworks, you look forward to all that God has in store. And it's certainly a joyful and exciting time for us as a church as well. I'm certainly very excited about joining you as the lead pastor this year. I'm excited about serving with Alex as well. Uh, and our deacons. And, and I'm excited about our mission that we have as a church here. We read it just now, but it's on the screen as well here, for the people of Penang and beyond to have and to keep having Jesus as Savior and Lord. What a glorious vision statement that is for us to pursue as a church as we head into 2023. And I'm certainly excited about all the plans that we're making moving forward as a church uh, in the next year. You know, we've made it through the, the difficult first steps of planting a brand new church. Many churches don't get new churches, don't get through that. Uh, we survived through two, three years of COVID. And that's been very challenging, hasn't it? Uh, but now we can look forward to, to continue to think how we can build a vibrant, gospel-centered, Bible-based church right here in the heart of Penang. And uh, this coming weekend, the elders and deacons are going to go away uh, with their families for two days uh, to reflect on our journey so far, to rejoice in God's grace, to refocus on our mission as a church, and to roll out our plans for the coming year. Please do be praying for us. So as we look forward to the future, a new year, new pastors, new plans, it's really important for us to refocus ourselves on God's great plan centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's plan to glorify himself through his church. Because there's no point for us to make all our wonderful plans for the year without any reference to God's great plan. We need to know God's great plan so that we can allow align our plans with his. Because very often as we make our plans, we're focused on the wrong things. As individuals, we ask questions like, what, what course should I study? What job should I take? What should I, who should I marry? Where should I live? And we'll ask all kinds of questions for the future of our church too. Important questions. Yes, all of them. But sometimes we're so focused on what is important to us that we take our eyes off what is most important to God. So if you're going to build a house, then you first need to study the blueprint very carefully. If you're going to build God's church, we first need to look at God's blueprint for how he grows his church. So as we begin this new year, what is God's great plan for the universe? What is God's will for our lives and our church? And how can we align our plans as individuals and as a church with God's great plan? Well, that's why uh, as we begin 2023, we're studying the book of Ephesians, because it is a book all about God's master plan for the universe to bring everything under the rule of our Lord Jesus Christ, a plan that he's going to work out in and through the church. We see that in verse 9 and 10 of our passage today. They're really key verses, headline verses for this book. We read, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in on earth, at the heart of God's great plan for the universe. From eternity past to eternity future, God is bringing everything in this world under the rule of King 
Jesus. And that is the plan that we need to embrace, that we will need to align ourselves to as a church. Now, the Apostle Paul, he introduces himself to us as the author of Ephesians in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And of course, an apostle was someone who was specifically chosen by Jesus to speak for him. It's something like a diplomat who would go to another country to, 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 rep, rep, uh, to represent the authorities to speak on their behalf. And that means when Paul is speaking in this letter, he's not just giving his own opinion about things, but he's speaking the word of God. He's making known the will of God to us, which we must embrace. And Paul mentions twice in this letter, in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, that he's writing from prison and he's probably in Rome about 61 to 62 AD. Now, he addresses the letter to the recipients in verse 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, Ephesus was on the coast of Asia Minor. And uh, we read about Paul's ministry there in Acts chapter 19. The church began with the conversion of some people who were formerly disciples of John the Baptist. And, and Paul preached the gospel and they were baptized uh, in the name of Christ. And then Paul went into the synagogue where he began to preach there for three months before stubborn rejection from the Jews drove Paul out. And he went to the hall of Tyrannus. And there we are told Paul preached for a whole year so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Ephesus was something like a hub city in that part of the world. It was a, it was a hub from which the gospel spread out to that whole region uh, around. And so it's sometimes suggested that the book of Ephesians is a circular letter intended for a wider audience and not just for the church of Ephesus. I think it's a, a, a theory that's impossible to prove in the end. But there is no doubt if Ephesus was a very important church, and this letter echoed out far beyond that city. Now, most in the church would have been Gentiles who previously worshipped other gods like Artemis. Acts chapter 19 tells us how many of them turned from their magic, magical practice to become Christians. In fact, so many turned from their pagan past that it caused a riot in the city and Paul was driven out. But notice how Paul calls these. Ephesian Christians, once pagans, once involved in all manner of magic and witchcraft. He says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul calls these Christians saints. He's not talking about special Christians here. He's not talking about you know, St. Mark or St. Mary or uh, some churches like to do that. He's talking to the church, isn't it? And here is a wonderful truth. No matter what our background was before we became Christians, when you turn to Christ, when you become a Christian, you become a saint. That is, you are holy and set apart for Jesus. So Paul writes the letter to the saints in Ephesus, and then he begins with his standard greeting in verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that greeting is a variation on the standard greeting of the day, but he's tweaked it to make a profound summary of the gospel. Do you see it? Grace to you. He's saying we've received grace from God, a, a gift from God that we don't deserve, a gift of salvation, and it brings us peace from God. That is a, a right relationship with God, no longer his enemies, but restored to him in peace. And with this opening, Paul hints at what this whole letter is going to be about. God's grand plan to graciously draw people to himself through the gospel of grace. And as Paul considers this great plan, he can't hold back in praise. Paul is so overcome with praise that verses 3 to 10 actually are one original, one long sentence in the Greek. He just overflows with one uh, praise after another as he considers all the blessings that we've been given in Jesus. Look at verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That, that's the first point this morning. God has given us every spiritual blessing. I think blessing is something that all people, Christians and non-Christians, wish to have. Uh, to be happy, uh, to be prosperous, 
I guess uh, Chinese New Year is coming. I notice all the decorations, they're kind of up already. In fact, I heard some Chinese New Year music playing even before Christmas was over. Amazing. The prosperity burgers and Sundays, they'll be out soon, aren't they, at McDonald's. We want blessing. I guess it's why we give people ang pao's. It's why we say gong si fa chai. It's why we eat yi sang, say, you know, all the blessings that will come. But the kind of blessings that our world is after, well, it's material blessings, isn't it? We want cars, we want careers, we want cash, we want condominiums, we want children, we want happiness, we want comfort, we want holidays. And so when we think of the blessed person, I guess we might think of, you know, the specialist doctor maybe who lives in a, a massive house down in Batu Fringi, dr drives a Mercedes Benz, who had uh, his buffet dinner at ENO for, for New Year's Eve and takes their spouse and children on overseas holidays while the maid stays back to clean up the house and look after the pet dog. I mean, I think that's probably a lot of people's picture of the blessed life. Material blessings in the here and now. And how, how often do we as Christians, well, actually we want the same. Deep down we're kind of jealous, aren't we? Become a Christian, they say. God will bless you. Health, wealth, happiness, success. Is that our message as a church as we go into 2023? Is that all that we have to preach? Material blessings, nothing more. No, not at all. We have true blessings. We have spiritual blessings. Look at verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not physical blessings. It's not cars and cash. It's not become a Christian. You'll have a wonderful, comfortable life. Spiritual blessings. And not blessings on earth, but blessings in the heavenly places. And not just one spiritual blessing or most of the spiritual blessings, but every spiritual blessing. Such is the lavish grace of God that God has given us all that he has to give. Every spiritual blessing that he has, he has poured it out in the Lord Jesus. So that if we are Christian here this morning, there are no additional spiritual blessings to get. There are not classes of Christians where some are more spiritual and some are less. Some are more blessed and some are less. No, as Christians, all Christians have been given every spiritual blessing that God has to give. Well, what does it look like to experience every spiritual blessing? Well, in the rest of this passage, Paul praises God as he outlines what they are. And as he does so, he, he sets forth God's grand plan for the universe. We move from eternity past in verses 3 to 6 to the cross at the center in verses 7 to 10. And then to eternity future in verses 11 to 14. Now, I don't know if you noticed the Trinitarian structure of this passage as well. We begin with the electing love of the Father, verses 3 to 6. The redeeming work of the Son, verses 7 to 10. The assuring work of the Holy Spirit, verses 11 to 14. Here is the grand plan of the triune God for our blessing and for his glory, his eternal plan centered on the Lord Jesus, which is meant to overflow in praise and glory to God. Let's drill down on these one by one. Firstly, the electing love of the Father. The electing love of the Father. Look again at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, notice how the Father is described there is as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not saying that Jesus is not God. We affirm that Jesus is fully and equally God with the Father. Uh, in fact, the name Lord that Jesus is given here is, was the name for God in, in the Old Testament. But it does so, show the roles within the Trinity, isn't it? The source of all the spiritual blessings is the Father who blesses us through the Son by his Holy Spirit. But it all begins, the source of it all, it begins with, in the mind of God the Father. Look at verse 4. It says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. 
the Christians are those who have been chosen by God, those who have been elected by God. And, and notice when this choosing, this election takes place, it is before the foundation of the world. God decides before we were born, before this world was made, before we'd done anything good or evil, who would be his people, who would be Christians. He decides, verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. I think sometimes we, we think that uh, when we became a Christian, it was primarily because of our own choice. We thought about it, we be, made a decision, and we decided to follow Jesus. And of course, we did make a real decision, and there was all kinds of circumstances that led up to that. But Paul is reminding us here that it is God's choice that was decisive. God chose us long before we chose him. In fact, we can only choose God because he first chose us. And that's underlined here by the next blessing that he shows us in verse 5. We were predestined for adoption. Look at verse 5. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now, to, to predestine something means to decide it in advance, right? It, it, here we're told God predestines us to be his children. He decides in advance before the creation of the world who will be his beloved children and who will not. It's a very humbling thought, isn't it? I think it's a thought that many people find very difficult to accept. There is a strand of thought that's called Arminianism. Uh, it traces back to John Wesley and then before that to a theologian called Jacobus Arminius. Uh, their teaching was a reaction against John Calvin and the, teaching, uh, and the teachings of Calvinism. Now, what, what Wesley taught, John Wesley taught, uh, was that God knows everything. He sees the future. And so what God did was he, he looked into the future to see those who would choose him, and then he chose them to be his people. So that in the end, it's, it's, it's our choice that matters more than God's choice. God chooses us because we chose him. Now, that view, it does seem perhaps more palatable, palatable to us because we like to think we are kind of in control of our lives. But it doesn't make sense of these verses, does it? Because if God made his choice based on our choice, then it was, wasn't really God's choice at all, was it? It was, it was our choice, really. And it doesn't fit with many other verses in the New Testament as well. Look at 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 on the screen, 2 Timothy 1.10. Paul says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And here we're told specifically that God's choice was before the ages began, and it had absolutely nothing to do with our works. He chose us because he chose us because he chose us, because of his own purpose, his own grace. So what then of, of free will then? John Wesley taught that we are neutral. We can choose God for ourselves, but we're going to see when we get to Ephesians 2, that's not the case. John chapter 2 verse 1 will say that we are dead in sins, unable to help ourselves, and then God intervened. He made us alive uh, in Christ. And, and chapter 2 verse 8 will say we were saved by grace through faith. Even our faith itself is the gift of God so that no one can boast. So, yes, we make real decisions to follow Jesus. We put our faith in him. But it's very clear that it is God himself who enabled that decision. And that thought, predestination or election as it's called here, notice what it does to Paul here. He overflows with praise to God. He celebrates it as a blessing, indeed the foundation of all God's other blessings, the gracious choice of God. I think sometimes as Christians we are a bit squirmish with the idea of uh, predestination. We know it can be a divisive issue in some circles. But I think if the idea of predestination doesn't move us to praise God, then it's probably because we haven't understood it. Because in these verses, Paul is praising God for predestining us. It's a blessing that overflows in thankfulness. I guess we, we begin to grasp that as we consider what he has predestined us 
4. Verse 4 says he chose us that we should be holy and blameless before him. That is set apart, cleansed from our, our sins, adopted as his own children. Indeed, he continues in verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus. Will. I think adoption is a beautiful thing, isn't it? A, a, a child is loved, but an adopted child is chosen. And the choice to adopt a child, it has nothing to do with the child, isn't it? The child is elected or, or predestined by the parent entirely of their own choice. The parent doesn't know what the child is going to be like. They don't know if they're going to grow up to be good or bad. They, they might see if they're cute or not, I guess. Now, the adopted child may choose later to love their adopted parents uh, as they grow up. But the first choice, the decisive choice, is the choice of the parents who chose them to be their child. And that choice by the, the parent to, to lavish on them their unconditional love uh, well, that's not something to be angry about, is it? That's not a, a, a contemptible idea that a parent would adopt a child and love them as their own. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's something to celebrate. And so predestination is the foundational blessing of God that we ought to delight in, to rejoice in, to celebrate in, because it, it, it signals God's love, unconditional love for rotten sinners like you and me. It means that we can belong to the greatest family of all, the heavenly family of God. So that's the first group of blessings we have here, the electing love of the Father. The second group of blessings is in verses 7 to 10, and now we come to the redeeming work of the Son, the redeeming work of the Son. Look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now, to redeem someone means to buy them out of captivity. And the great act of redemption in the Old Testament was the Exodus. Remember God's people, they were slaves in Egypt to Pharaoh, but God brought judgment upon the Egyptians and led his people out to freedom. This was achieved through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. They killed a perfect one year old lamb, they painted its blood on the doorpost, and as they trusted in that sacrifice, the angel of death passed passed over them so that they could be free from God's judgment and they could go forth free as his people. And Paul says, we have been redeemed through his blood. Not redeemed from physical slavery. None of us are slaves to Pharaoh at the moment, I don't think. But from spiritual slavery. We're freed from sin and death and the devil. Again, we'll see in chapter 2, all of us once dead in sin, following the world, the devil and our own sinful desires, children of wrath, deserving the judgment of God. But Jesus came. He shed his blood to redeem us from all our sins. He was the ultimate Passover lamb. Because there on the cross, Jesus died for our sins. He took the punishment that we deserve for all that we have done wrong. His blood was shed that we might be forgiven and be set free. I think there is almost no greater blessing than being forgiven. And when you've done wrong to another person and you know you've messed up and that guilt is kind of weighing on your shoulders, crushing your spirit, that's very difficult, isn't it? I wonder if you've ever felt that weight of guilt where you have failed someone badly. But forgiveness, it's so liberating, isn't it? lifting that heavy load of guilt and shame from us, setting us free. That's the blessing that we have through Jesus Christ. Now, some of us may be thinking, well, you don't know what I've, I've done. God could never forgive me for that thing that lies in my past. Look again at verse 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of, of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. That verse is saying that God knows exactly what you are like. Every thought, every deed, everything that's in your past, and guess what? He knows your present and future too. But such are the riches of God's grace that with full knowledge of all of our sins, he still chooses to forgive us. He still chooses to adopt us as his own children. What a blessing. What an astounding blessing. 
Friends, if you are a Christian here this morning, know this wonderful blessing that you have from God. Your sins are fully forgiven. They've been dealt with fully at the cross. You are now God's beloved child, and he's molding you day by day to make you holy and blameless before him. Some of us here might be unbelievers here this morning. Uh, we're investigating the Christian faith. Do you know your need for forgiveness? Turn to Jesus. Begin here 2023 with a fresh start. God can lift that burden of guilt, bring you peace with God. Now, God's redemptive plan here through Jesus, it doesn't end with the cross. God is uniting everything under the rule of Christ. And we see that in verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. We often ask, isn't it, what is God's will for my life? You know, should I be a dentist or a doctor? They seem to be the only options for uh, Asians, isn't it? Should I marry this person or should I marry that person? Or we might ask, what is God's plan for our church? Should we do this activity? Should we do that? We're not left in the dark, are we? We don't need to listen to for some still small voice to tell us the will of God. We don't need some feeling of peace to know that God wants us to do this or that. And we certainly don't need to study our circumstances to see if it's an open door or a closed door. God has revealed to us his plan, you see. The mystery of his will has been revealed. What's that plan? It's to unite everything, to sum up everything under the rule of King Jesus. It's one of the great things, I think, about the name of this church, cross and crown. Not only does God redeem us through the cross, but he brings us under the crown, under the rule of King Jesus. So what's your New Year's Res resolutions for this year? You know, is it trying to lose weight again? Uh, is it uh, trying to eat less Nazi Lamak in the morning? Uh, that's my New Year's resolution, I guess. What's your plan for your life? What are you working towards? Having a good career, moving abroad to greener pastures, getting married, having a family, having a child. What are our plans as a church? You know, let's get a big fancy building. Let's have a, a, an awesome rock band to lead the music every week. <laughs> you know, have a good fellowship and food every week after the service. What's our plan as a church for 2023? So often our plans have nothing to do with God's plan, isn't it? Here is God's plan to bring everything under the rule of King Jesus. So often we're living for ourselves, for earthly blessings, rather than making Christ known. Here is God's plan. plan. And this is really what the book of Ephesians is all about. Our church is to be shaped by the will of God, the great plan of God from eternity past to eternity future, centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, the cross and the crown. We'll see what that looks like as we move through the rest of this book. So the electing love of the Father, the redeeming work of the Son, and then finally, the, the assuring work of the Holy Spirit. So having praised God for his work in the past, having praised God for his blessings in the center of history through the cross and the crown, we now look to the future, the eternal future, as God brings both Jews and Gentiles the hope, the common hope of a heavenly inheritance. Look at verse 11. He says, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Now, an inheritance is something you get from a loved one when they die, isn't it? And we're told here, as God's adopted children, we too are going to get an inheritance. What's the inheritance? Uh, it's not money, is it? Or property or something like that. So much better. In the Old Testament, Israel's inheritance was the promised land. God elected his people as he chose them, making promises to Abraham. He redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt through the Passover lamb, and then he brought them to their inheritance, the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land where they could enjoy all of God's blessings in his presence. And then that, that promised land in the Old Testament, the Old Testament inheritance foreshadows the heavenly inheritance that all of God's people will receive, a place in God's presence 
where sin and sickness and vision and death and all spoils our world is gone forever. And Paul reminds us here that that heavenly inheritance is absolutely secure because it's not dependent upon our choice, but God's gracious and sovereign choice. Look again at verse 11. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. See, when you receive an inheritance, it depends not on the will of the receiver, but on the will of the giver, isn't it? You can try to be nice to an old person, but it doesn't mean they're going to give you an inheritance at the end, isn't it? They can, you know, they can do a, a doozy on you, as we would say in Australia, right? You can try that out. That word out later, I challenge you. An inheritance by its very nature is a gift. It's something that can't be earned, but can only be given. And so heaven, we're told, is God's gracious gift to his adopted children. And it's absolutely certain because the one who's giving it to us is the one we're told who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The one who is all-knowing and all-powerful, who controls all of history from beginning to end, he is the one who has decided to give you a place in heaven. Isn't that reassuring? Because it means nothing in all creation can stop us from receiving that inheritance God has promised. Now, we mustn't think that God's sovereign predestining choice means that it doesn't matter how we respond to Jesus. We, we're told in verse 13 that we do need to receive and respond to the gospel. Verse 13 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. For God's sovereign choice doesn't mean the gospel shouldn't be preached. God's sovereign choice doesn't mean that we mustn't listen and respond to the word of God. It's as we believe in Jesus that we receive salvation, that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But it is God's work. It is God's Holy Spirit bringing faith in our hearts. And as we come to Jesus in faith, we receive the Holy Spirit, the seal and guarantee of our inheritance. We're told in verse 14, the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Normally when you buy a car or you buy a house, you need to put down a deposit up front, say 20% or so, as a guarantee that you're going to pay the rest of it by installments. So also God has given us a guarantee of our inheritance. He didn't have to do that. God always does what he says. But the Holy Spirit is meant to assure us. It's a down payment. It's an upfront blessing that assures us God's going to deliver on all the rest. We can be absolutely certain we will be with God in glory because he's already given us his Holy Spirit now. He's already present with us in our hearts. There is no, no doubt if we are Christian whether or not we will make it to heaven. God will guarantee that we will. So do you see God's glorious plan stretching from eternity past to eternity future, centered on the death and resurrection of Jesus, the electing love of the Father, the redeeming work of the Son, the assuring work of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't it make you want to praise and glorify God for his grace to you? As we close, I want us to make two final observations. Uh, this is the second point. This is going to be very brief. We are only blessed in Christ. We're only blessed in Christ. I don't know if you noticed how every one of the spiritual blessings we've just considered is connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, God blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4, God chose us in him to be holy. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, God blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. Verse 9, he's made known his will, which he set forth in Christ. Verse 10, God's plan is to unite all things in Christ. Verse 11, in Christ, we've obtained an inheritance. Verse 12, we hope in Christ. And verse 13, in Christ, we were sealed with a promised Holy Spirit. No less than 10 times. I'm not sure if I counted that rightly. But nearly every verse here are connected with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see? 
We can only be blessed like this when we are united with faith with the Lord Jesus. It's like in a marriage, as a husband and a wife make their vows, the two become one flesh, united as one. So when we put our faith in Christ, we are united to him. And everything that is ours becomes his. He takes our sin. He takes our punishment. He takes our judgment. He bears it on the cross. And everything that is his becomes ours. His sonship, his inheritance, all his blessings. See, God has located the fullness of his blessing in Christ, which means that if you are not yet a Christian, then you have no spiritual blessings. No spiritual blessings. We must understand this. There's no spiritual blessing in Buddhism. There's no spiritual blessing in Hinduism or in any other religion that you want to fill in. There is only spiritual blessing in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has located all his blessings in him. And so if you want God's blessing, then you must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You must trust in his death on the cross for you. You must submit to his rule over your life. And so if you're not yet a believer, stop looking for blessing in other places. Come to the Lord Jesus. Put your life in line with God's great plan and let Jesus take his place as the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you've done that, and know for certain you have every single one of these blessings here. There's no hierarchy in God's kingdom. There's no people who are more blessed than others. If we are Christians, we are all God's adopted children. We are all forgiven of our sins, and we're all headed to heaven together. You can't be any more blessed than you already are. So how should we respond? This is the final point. We're blessed for God's glory. We're blessed for God's glory. Do you notice the ultimate goal of God's great plan here is God's own glory? If we've truly understood all the blessings bestowed on us here, then it should overflow with glory and praise to God. We see that in, all through this passage. Verse 3 begins with praise be to God. Verse 6 talks about to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12 says to the praise of his glory. And the last verse again to the praise of his glory from beginning to end. Paul is concerned with the praise and glory of God. It's so easy to think life is about us, isn't it? Especially when we consider all the blessings that God has given us. It's so easy to think that we are at the center of the universe and God exists to serve us. Maybe we even think that our church is at the center of the universe. I don't know. How wrong we are at the center of the universe is not us but God. And life is not ultimately about our will and our glory, but God's will and God's glory. God predestines us. He redeems us. He reveals his plan. He gives us this inheritance so that we might live to the praise of his glory. Many, many years ago, there, uh, people believed that the earth was at the center of the universe, that the stars and the sun, they all revolved around the earth. But in the Copernican Revolution, a scientist, Earth actually went around the sun. The Earth was not the center. And some of us may need to have our own Copernican re Revolution this morning to realize that life is not about me and about my will. It's about God and his glory. So as we head into this year, we make our resolutions not just to do what's going to make me happy, but what's going to bring glory to God. So as we begin this year, what is God's will for our lives? What's God's will for this church? It's not to fill us with all manner of material blessings so that we can be happy and comfortable. God wants us to see that real blessings are spiritual blessings, not temporary blessings, but eternal blessings. God wants us to see that at the center of his plan is not us and our happiness, but him and his glory. I think we need to grasp this truth, isn't it? We might wish that this year God's going to give us better marks, maybe a graduation for a couple here, uh, or a larger bank balance, or good, good promotions at work, or a perfect marriage, or whatever it may be. 
But no matter how important those things seem to us right now, God wants us to be reminded this morning that all those things are secondary compared to the wonderful blessings that we have in Jesus. God's glorious plan is to bring everything under the rule of Jesus. And the amazing news of the gospel is that we can share in that plan. So I guess as we look forward to 2023, with all our hopes and dreams individually and as a church, may we align our plan with God's great plan. For if we have experienced the electing love of the Father, the redeeming work of the Son, and the assuring work of the Holy Spirit, then what else can we do but live our lives to the praise of his glorious grace? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we want to praise you for your, your great love that you have shown to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you chose us, you adopted us to be your own children. Thank you that you have redeemed us from our sins and secured for us a glorious heavenly inheritance. Help us, Lord, as we begin this year to be truly grateful for all these blessings that we have, whether or not this year will be smooth or it will be very difficult. Lord, fill our hearts with thanks to you, with gratitude to you for all that you have done for us and all that you will do for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.